Guys, welcome to another episode of the Breathe Success Radio. I'm really excited to have with me today, Dr. Ghazala Easy Aziz, sorry, Scott. I knew I was going to mess that up. <laughs> <laughs> so today, uh, Doctor, uh, you're going to be speaking about uh, mainly PCOS and helping uh, females that maybe are suffering with PCOS. So before we get going into the conversation, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit more, uh, a little bit about you, tell people who you are and what your background is. Sure, sure. So um, my name is Ghazala Aziz Scott. I'm a women's health expert um, and I combined my Oxbridge scientific knowledge with over two decades of NHS medical experience. Uh, and my special focus is on a functional approach to women's hormonal balancing and a real passion for finding holistic solutions to well-being. I want to empower women to take control of their health and really understand what's going on. And actually, by simple holistic solutions, um, finding um, better ways to deal with their health problems and optimise their health. Um, so, so my initial experience of PCOS has largely been in the NHS. So I've been an NHS GP for over two decades now. Um, and even in the space of time that I've been working, you know, our understanding of PCOS has really changed. So when I first became um, a GP, you know, it was like, oh, well, it's kind of a spectrum of normal. Oh, you've got PCOS. Um, you know, people didn't really think anything of it. They thought, oh, well, you've got irregular periods. Um, you're a bit spotty, you know, and it was like, well, uh, you know, um, here's a leaflet, here's the pill, here's, you know, and, and off you go. And mm. actually, as time has gone on, we understand that it's much more complex than that. And actually, PCOS is a very complex hormonal metabolic condition, mm. and it affects women throughout their lives. So um, it's really important that women recognize that they might have it, and, and what that means for them. And we know that women who have PCOS, they have a much more increased risk of cardiovascular problems, diabetes, infertility, endometrial cancer, a, a host of things. So it's yeah. really important that women have an understanding um, of what's going on. Now it's incredibly common. It's about that, you know, yes. the incidence can be up to about 10 to 20%. Um, and I think it could be growing because I think there are lots of things in our modern lifestyles that could be making us much more predisposed to having a PCOS type of picture. Mm. So I think even us talking today about the lifestyle changes that you can make to improve your hormonal balance will improve your risk of getting some kind of spectrum of PCOS. Yes. So you, you said about the PCOS where, where um, doctors didn't really know much about it. How long ago was that, would you say? Um, I'd say sort of 10 to 20 years, you know, about maybe tw about I'd say two to three decades ago. You okay. know, the other thing is that, you know, women's health is so underfunded and so under-researched. Right. Um, you know, and I think even this PCOS, it kind of falls into two camps. So, you know, specialists aren't really that interested in it because it's, you know, it's a very, very common condition. It's not life-threatening though mm. it has lots of implications yes. it's not something you can chop out so you know surgeons aren't interested in it yeah. um and in general practice um you know a lot of people don't have a huge amount of knowledge about it um the conventional treatments i think are you know they, they've got lots of issues with them, which we'll go into. Um, and so I think it falls between, you know, two camps where the specialists aren't dealing with it. The GPs don't really have enough knowledge to deal yeah. with it. You know, they're not keeping up to with the research. And there's stacks and stacks of research coming out. Um, coming out. Yeah. And also now, you know, functional medicine, a more integrative approach is is you know becoming more popular. Now yeah. we're beginning to see that actually PCOS is very suited to um, you know, the, the integrative approach because it's so multifactorial. And I wanted to ask you a question. I'm, I'm, I was never sure about this. You know, PCOS, is it always to do with lifestyle or is it something that just happens within the body for whatever reason? No, no, no. They're, they're, it, I mean, lifestyle things make it worse, but I'm going to go into, um, you know, the different types of PCOS. Yeah. So I thought what we will initially start off by doing is talking about the signs of PCOS. So cool. we know that PCOS is... Um, very underdiagnosed and a lot of people just don't know they have it because there's so many different types. So one of the biggest um, 
symptoms is irregular periods. So women have irregular periods. They may only have two or three cycles a year. You know, it can be that irregular. And mm. some women don't even think that that's a problem. Yes. Um, so the irregular periods are called, one of the things in PCOS is that you have raised levels of androgens, which are the male sex hormones. So women do have a few, a, a small percentage of male sex hormones. So in PCOS, you have high testosterone levels. What this testosterone does is that it has an impact on your ovaries and it causes your ovaries to produce a lot less estrogen. Now, when your ovaries produce a lot less estrogen, it means that they don't do their monthly job of ovulating. If they don't ovulate, we don't produce progesterone. Progesterone is produced in the second half of our cycle, and that is produced after ovulation, and yes. progesterone prepares the lining of the womb for possible implantation. So we don't produce progesterone in this situation. Now, low levels of progesterone then have a feedback on the brain, and um, it has an impact on this hormone called luteinizing hormone, and luteinizing hormone levels go up. This then stops the ovary producing even more estrogen. And it also causes the ovary to produce more testosterone. So we get into this vicious cycle where we've got too much testosterone and that testosterone just keeps going round and round and round. We're getting more and more testosterone and lower levels of estrogen and very low levels of progesterone. Uh, progesterone. And um, the, the, now the where PCOS you know, the, 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 the metabolic implications or kick in is that the high testosterone levels causes insulin resistance. It causes mm. your insulin levels to rise. And this is one of the, the factors in PCOS that causes all of the long-term implications. So this is, you know, how we get irregular periods. The second um, thing that really disturbs a lot of women is hirsutism. So hirsutism is where we get hair where we don't want it. So in the male pattern. So yes. women get a lot of hair on their face, on their chest, on their arms. And it's quite thick, coarse hair. And mm. this can be really disturbing for women, and especially women of darker skin. Um, you know, they've already got dark hair. So if it's thicker and coarser, this can yeah. be really, really uh, disfiguring. And so, you know, women can spend a lot of money on electrolysis and laser treatments to try and get rid of this hair. The other thing with PCOS is weight gain. It's really, really easy to put on weight and it's really, really difficult to lose weight. Lose it. Yep. And yeah, and, and it's and it is a metabolic issue. I mean, I, I've got several friends, close friends who've got PCOS, and actually they're really good with their diets, but it's really hard for them to lose weight. Yeah. So the mechanisms underlying um the 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 issues with weight gain are insulin resistance. So if you're insulin resistant, you are going to gain weight. And the other thing is um, leptin resistant. Le leptin is a hormone that's secreted by our fat cells. And it's the hormone that signals to your brain that you're full up, stop eating. And in um, people with PCOS, leptin uh, production is very, very low. So actually wow. they don't have that feedback mechanism. So wow. it's really easy for them to overeat. Of course, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, the other thing, another thing is acne. So a lot of women have uh, very bad skin. So increased testosterone causes a lot of sebum production in the skin and um, they're, they're much more prone to getting um, acne, especially around the mouth. Um, a lot of women don't discover they might have PCOS till they start thinking, oh, I want to have a baby. And then they have problems in conception. Now, one of the issues is if you're only having two or three periods per year and you're not ovulating, how are you going to get pregnant? You're not releasing an egg. Yes. Um, but we also know that the, um, the insulin resistance that's created by the PCOS hormonal pattern also has an impact on the ovaries. So there is more inflammation in the ovaries and it doesn't create the ideal environment in the ovaries for ovulation either. Mm. Inflammation itself also has an impact on people's fertility. Um, other, other things that people can notice is that they have more skin pigmentation. They have this is called acanthosis nigrans. It's like this sort of velvety black pigmentation. They can have it in their underarms, in their thigh creases. Um, Depression and anxiety is also very, very prevalent in women with PCOS. Um, I mean, some of it is also the um, disfiguration they feel, you know, when they're overweight, they've got acne, they've got hairy skin, they just don't, they, you know, people lose their self-confidence. It's very hard for them to address those issues, Absolutely. even though they try quite hard. 
um, you know, in our society, so much emphasis is put on appearance, you know, mm. with social media. So it becomes quite a problem. But there are metabolic issues with the PCOS that predispose women to getting um, psychological issues. So we know that inflammation in the body also causes inflammation in the brain. Um, and this can predispose women to getting depression and anxiety. We know that inflammation in the body affects the gut microbiome. Now, these are the bacteria that we've got in our gut, and they're very important for producing neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are the, the, the chemicals in our brain that you know can have the feel-good factor in our mood. And a lot of that can be disturbed by these metabolic changes of polycystic ovaries. Um, some women can get sleep apnea. So sleep apnea is when people don't get a good quality of sleep. It's very often related to obesity mm. um, and that can really impact people's quality of life. Um, fatty liver is another thing that women can get. And this is because the insulin resistance means that we don't absorb glucose into our cells. Now, this excess glucose is floating That's around our blood. bloodstream yeah. and it then becomes fat. And it becomes a very toxic kind of fat called triglycerides. Yes. And triglycerides go and sit in the liver. And then this gives you a fatty liver. Now, this is reversible if people are able to address their lifestyle issues. But yes. if they're not, then this can become a big problem. And finally, I'm going to talk about the ovarian cysts. So polycystic ovarian syndrome. People always think, oh, well, it's about the cysts. But actually, the cysts are not always present in women with polycystic ovaries so when you look in young women they have um lots of they often have quite a lot of cysts but as women get older those cysts you know aren't so apparent so you can't always rely on poly the polycystic appearance on the ultrasound mm. to diagnose you with polycystic ovary you have to look at all of the symptoms and the, the patterns that you're you're seeing um, so we'll, we'll go into how is it diagnosed? How, how can someone know that they've got polycystic ovaries? Yeah. So in conventional medicine, we have this thing called the Rotterdam criteria. And there are three things. There is irregular cycles, um, high androgens, which are the male hormones, so yeah. testosterone is one of them, and um, cysts on the ovaries. But you can have a diagnosis of polycystic ovaries if you've got two out of three of these criteria. Okay. So some women have raised um, testosterone um, they have irregular periods, but they've got no cysts. Some women have got a normal a testosterone, they've got irregular periods, and they've got cysts. So you can have a bit of a combination. And very often, people can move through different combinations mm. during the course of their lives. So the classic polycystic ovary is that you've got all three of the, these, these yes. features. Um, and this is uh, the, the kind of polycystic ovaries that is the insulin resistant polycystic ovaries. This is the one that's associated with what doctors call metabolic syndrome. So you've got a higher risk of heart problems, cholesterol problems. You could have a stroke. It's really not good. Yes. Um, and it has lots of long term implications for the body. And that, that's the kind of PCOS where you see women putting on a lot of weight, often being obese, even you know with the best will in the world where they're trying. Mm. We also have inflammation based PCOS. Now this is a lot to do with our modern lifestyles. So this is the number of toxins we've got in the environment causing inflammation in our body. This is to do with uh, chronic viral infections. This is to do with um, hormone disruptors. So there's lots of things in, our, in, in, in the products that we use in our homes to clean our homes, cosmetics that are what we call xenoestrogens. So they're actually endocrine disruptors so they disrupt the, the hormonal balance in our body and also in functional medicine we call it the sad diet because functional medicine is largely um, from the state so it's the sad american diet and it, i say the bad the bad uh, the, right. you know the bad british diet um really um so essentially, you know, many people have diets that are extremely high in processed foods, and that's the new toxin. Processed foods, you know, people are rushing around, buying loads of ready yeah. meals and plastic, sticking them in the microwave. You know, we've lost that, you know, that 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 sort of what our, you know, the, the pattern of eating that our grandparents had, where mm. there was lots of whole unpressed food, unprocessed Absol food. Absolutely. So now it's you know really high sugar content i noticed on facebook you pe posted that that um, blueberry muffin from costa or wherever it's crazy it was. it's that crazy 409 calories madness like 27 grams of sugar, sugar yeah and about four grams of protein and i thought oh my god you know that is actually the calorific 
uh, you know, content of a meal, really. And you haven't Absolutely. even had a new latte at that no, stage. No, which pe people would have, had, <laughs> would have had a latte and a muffin, yeah. right? Yeah, 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 exactly. Easily, That's a thousand calories. calories. Yeah, so yeah. That, that is like poison to your body. It yeah. really is. That sugar is like poison. And actually, we know that, you know, the obesity epidemic is largely about sugar. You know, mm. there's a lot of negative messages that we had in the past that it's all about fat, you know, low fat, low fat, low fat. Yes, but yes. actually, it's not low fat. It's the fact that we're, because people have low fat, they have more carbs. Um, a lot of the low fat products that people buy, um, they're at, they taste crap if you don't have sugar in them. Yes. So the low fat products actually Higher have a lot carbohydrates. of carbohydrates. Yes. Yeah. So actually, this is what's causing our obesity epidemic. Um, the other type of polycystic ovaries you can get is the ones that's induced by synthetic hormones. So lots of women who go on the pill for years and years and years or have a coil put in, when that coil is removed or they go off the pill, they have really, really irregular cycles. And if they're a bit overweight, you know, they can get a sort of PCOS type of picture. Or, or, or no cycles at all. I've, I've, I've actually, I actually know somebody who was on the coil for many years, has come off the yeah. coil to try and get pregnant and she, she hasn't had a period for about a year. Yeah. So, I mean, in that situation, she might have subclinical PCOS. I mean, that, that obviously, once you haven't had a period for a year, that needs to be looked at. But, yeah. you know, though, when you disrupt the natural pattern of your body, um, you know, very often it take, you, you, your brain forgets that feedback loop between your ovaries and your brain to yes. like, have the regular cycles. And of with course. PCOS, that's obviously switched off anyway, yeah. or very weak. So you can see that if you've switched it off through synthetic um, hormones actually sometimes your body just goes I don't know what to do now yeah uh, you know and then you do definitely need to seek medical help as to you know what you might be able to do to, to get things yeah. back online so the so with all of the so this is how we diagnose polycystic ovaries in if you go to your GP very often they'll do a few simple blood tests a lot of GPs won't even be looking at the metabolic picture and also the metabolic picture develops over time. So if you've got a young woman coming in in her early 20s, she probably hasn't got the full metabolic picture. She's just in the early stages yes. of her PCOS. Um, so the way we would do, we would often carry out some hormonal blood tests, um, look at your testosterone levels, send you off for an ultrasound. And so we'd have, you know, some kind of idea of what's going on. But in the functional medicine world and in the integrative medicine world, we'd be doing a hell of a lot more to investigate the exact nature of what your PCOS is. Number one, we'd have taken a very complex history, you know, often 45 minutes to an hour yes. of really what is going on with you. So we then, you know, have much more of an idea of what sort of things we need to target. And then mm. in the functional medicine world or, you know, at the clinic that I work at, the Marion Gluck Clinic, um, we will often do insulin levels we will also look at your cortisol production we will also look at um we do this test called the dutch test which is looking at the metabolites of different hormones in your urine and through that we get a much more detailed picture of, of what's, what's going, going on for each individual woman um so uh, and then uh, obviously the ultrasound is 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 quite a useful investigation because you know we can see whether you've got cysts or not yes. so in the conventional world um very often i mean again the use of metformin which is an anti-diabetic drug goes in fashion so you know about 10 years ago it was quite in fashion and you know women, especially women with the typical pcos with the insulin, insulin resistance, resistance. Um, you know, metformin was was being used. And it. I, I mean, I've had experience where I think it has helped certain women lose weight, but it's got a lot of side effects. Yes. It's got, you know, it, ha it can cause bloating, it can cause diarrhea, it can cause nausea. And the other thing is, um, what we hope is that if we gave you metformin and you lose weight, your insulin sensitivity would go down and your hormonal balance would improve. But we yes. haven't really taught you about what the root causes of your problem are. Exactly. So at some stage, you've got to come off that metformin. Yes. And when you come off that metformin, you know, if you, you, carry, on with this, if you carry on with your normal lifestyle, you're probably going to yeah. put that way back on. Or you're not specifically addressing. I think people, women with PCOS, unfortunately, can't be naughty. They have to really be good Strict, with their yeah. lifestyles. They can't take their finger off the, pe the, off, the, off, the, off the accelerator. If they do, then they pile the weight back on again. And that, and I, you know, I think it is, it's a tough condition to deal with for a lot yes. of people. Yes. Um, so metformin, you know, um, I think I think if you're pre-diabetic, so if you know your doctor's done some blood tests and you have 
um, markers in your blood that show that you're pre-diabetic. Maybe it's an option for you, but I think we have to think long and hard about what are the root causes of, of your PCOS. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then when a lot of women get put on the pill. So a lot of women get alarmed by the fact that they're not getting regular cycles. So actually, if you put them on the pill and they get a regular withdrawal bleed, they think, great, I'm getting regular cycles. But they're not ovulating, are they? No. The thing about the pill is that it, you're, you're, you're giving someone artificial hormones, which switches off ovulation. Yes. So while you're taking the pill, you're getting these withdrawal bleeds, but these are not natural cycles. No. Now, there's a lot of controversy about the pill at the moment because, you know, it, it, I think, you know, with the sort of, you know, women's revolution and women delaying childbirth and becoming very careery, it was actually ideal. You thought, right, you put women on the pill, they're not going to get pregnant. It's a very, very reliable form of contraception. And then women can wait for two decades and then they can get pregnant. Yes. Now we're realizing that actually it's very important for women to have some kind of sense of what their hormonal balance is and what their natural cycles are. And we actually know that our natural hormones have lots of benefits for our body. Synthetic hormones have side effects. Absolutely. And a lot of women don't realize what these side effects are. They've been on the pill for so long. They don't even know what's normal for them. Absolutely. So what we're finding now is actually um, the synthetic estrogen may not be sufficient in quantity for, for, for women. And also it can interfere with serotonin, which is one of the, the feel good hormones in yep. your brain, the neurotransmitters, you know, that, that improves your mood. So a lot of women can actually feel a bit low on the pill. Depressed and, yeah. Also know that synthetic progestogens can actually stimulate testosterone receptors. Now, if you've got PCOS and you've got a problem with, with testosterone, you're adding it on, you, aren't you? You're adding it on. So actually, you know, your symptoms can get worse. Um, so we, we're now thinking, actually, you know, it's really important for women to have much more sense of their natural cycle. Actually, you know, women, the, the natural cycle is probably um, quite beneficial if you work with it. So women often find that they feel really good in the first half of their cycle. Their libido is high in the middle of their cycle yeah. and they're more creative. Yes. And then actually the period is supposed to be a time for you to rest relax. and reflect and self care and relax. Absolutely. So actually a lot of women, if you, if you go with your cycle and you think, right, I'm not going to plan some high powered presentation in the middle of my period. Absolutely. I'm going to do it at the beginning of my cycle. You know, I think they can, you can work more with your body instead of just switching everything off. Yes. Now, the other thing is, you know, a lot of women, they've been on the pill for, a couple, for maybe a couple of decades. They may not even know they've got polycystic ovaries. Mm. Then, hey, presto, 35, they go, right, 20 years of the pill, I want to have a baby. They come off the pill and it's a disaster. They don't know what their patterns are. They don't know what's going on with their body. And then they're not ovulating. Yeah. Um, so this is the problem. And then in dive the gynecologists and the IVF experts and off <laughs> they go. And, and then the, before you know it, they're on an IVF cycle. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, initially, um, you know, women uh, in general practice, we used to give women this agent called clomiphene. Now we used to be able to give it in general practice about 10, 20, about 20 years ago. And it's an ovulation induction agent, but you can't do that anymore. That has to be given in, um, in, in the specialist setting because you have a risk of twin pregnancies and ovarian hyperstimulation. So we don't do that anymore. But this is where I really think it's important for women to realize that actually, you know, the pill may not be the answer to everything. And the problem with conventional medicine is we use the pill for absolutely every single everything. female hormonal ailment. It's like, let's just switch your ovaries off. That's the, that's the, that's the, the, the solution. But it really, really isn't. Mm. Um, so, you know, I really want to get that message out there that, you Absolutely. know, maybe think about other forms of contraception and, you know, in general practice, when I've seen somebody who's been on it for about 10 years, I might say to them, well, you know, maybe you should come off it for a while. Maybe we should see, you know, how your body's working. Yeah. So, um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about, you know, what the integrative approach, um, yes, for sure. to, to PCOS. So uh, as we've covered, it's massively underdiagnosed. Um, it's massively under-resourced PCOS and also the, the long-term consequences are massively under-recognized. And I think it's really important to put the patient at the center of this situation. 
So I think it's very important in the integrative approach, we look at the physical, the psychological, the spiritual, um, you know, what kind of environmental factors are going on for the woman. Um, and we, we try and develop a personalized strategy. So we're looking at what are the patient's goals? What are the patient's unique circumstances? What are their, what are their needs? And we try and get a unique picture of what's going on for that woman yeah. in her particular life. Um, and then we look at what are the appropriate interventions. Now, it's not, you know, it's not hocus pocus. We are, we, it, they are, they are um, scientific based um, interventions. You know, we can use things from conventional medicine. We can use things from the integrative world. Um, we can use um, acupuncture is known to improve ovulation. There's lots of herbal adaptogens we can use. There's lots that we need to make sure women are maximizing their diet, Everything. their lifestyle, the supplements. So there's so many, many different things, things yeah. that we can look at for each individual woman. Um, so, so, um, I mean, we'll just have a quick chat about the, the root causes of, um, PCOS. Yeah. So we know that for many women, it's a genetic condition. So, um, and it's carried through both the maternal and the paternal genes. So in the days of old in the hunter gatherer days, being, having PCOS was probably a survival advantage because if you've got a body that conserves fat and conserves energy, you're going to survive. If there was a famine or periods of no food, you would survive. And if you were slightly less fertile, that was an advantage to you because in the days before the pill, you know, women had multiple pregnancies and women often died in childbirth. So if you couldn't ovulate that much, you can't, you can't get so pregnant, you, you can't get pregnant. And then basically that does confer some kind of survival advantage on you. And then you've only got a few children so you have more resources to raise those children yes, yes. and indeed you know for, for men as well there are some metabolic advantages to carrying you know the, uh, sort of you know the genes related to PCOS, PCOS so this is why you know you'd think well why why has this not been wiped out because actually to a certain extent it did confer a survival advantage mm. and the thing is before we had you know costa muffins and yes. lattes people couldn't eat that much you know you had to go and kill your animal you know pick your pick your yeah. crops yeah. make your food and that was it then you had nothing you didn't have the fridge so actually people's bmis uh, you know they just didn't get that fat they weren't yes. that big um so you know this is where you know it's our modern modern Lifestyle. life where food is just available every single opportunity omnipresent isn't it yeah yeah that that this is this is the therefore what's exacerbated you know um this situation and what underpins pcos and its metabolic complications is inflammation inflammation in the body everywhere so women with pcos have a low grade of inflammation everywhere in their body um and a lot of this inflammation comes within the fat tissue so we used to think fat was just fat you know it was like an inert thing and you know you could liposuction it off but actually it's not we know that it's a very active metabolic tissue and it's got good you know we know that fat tissue's got advantages for the body so a lot of our hormones can be made in the fat tissue and um, leptin, our friend leptin that we've spoken about, who, who it, that's your, you know, I've had enough to eat yeah, hormone, yeah. Um, that comes from fat tissue. So your fat tissue signals, uh, releases leptin, signals to your brain, you've had enough to eat, stop. stop, stop. And that's when you've got a good balance. Um, but in women with PCOS, what happens is that they have abnormal um, patterns of leptin secretion and the fatter they get, the, the more that pattern gets disrupted. They also have low levels of another hormone called adiponectin. And adiponectin is really important in blood sugar regulation and breakdown of your tissue. So if you haven't got enough of that, then that can have a metabolic impact. The other thing is when your fat cells get to a certain size, they get leaky and they leak these things called non-esterified fatty acids out. Now these are really toxic and um, cause um, all sorts of um, issues in the body and it causes inflammation. So you get all of these inflammatory markers being thrown out, um, things like um, interleukins and cytokines and the, these, the inflammatory response when it's in, when, when you've got a bacteria entering, entering your body, the inflammatory response is important. It's important to catch that bacteria, get rid of it, mount your immune response. But when you've got inflammation gone wild, 
then all of these inflammatory markers that are thrown off have a really, really negative impact on your body. And this is what happens in PCOS. Mm. Now, you know, we've, we've had a lot, learn, heard a lot about in the media about obesity and the link with COVID. So again, obesity causes this lipotoxicity and all of these inflammatory markers, that, uh, inflammatory chemicals that get thrown off, this impacts your immune system. So we know there's a big link between you know how you your your prognostic um you know your prognosis with covid and how you know how big you are this is probably why you know we know that you know america america has a, an obesity epidemic and this yes. is why their rates are so ridiculously really high. high yeah and even in the uk so it's really important to understand that fat tissue is not always healthy and it's really important for us to to address obesity yes um so what do we do about all of this? Absolutely. So, so um, let's talk about diet. So um, what we know is that it's really important to, to address diet and lifestyle in PCOS. And it's really important to optimize um, your diet and your lifestyle to, to get the best possible results. Now, you know, bearing in mind, it is hard to lose weight. And if you lose weight, it's very hard to regain it. So you're up, you know, I, th I find with a lot of women with the classical type of PCOS, they're on an upward mountain. And I think it's really important for people to have a compassionate um, understanding of, of um, you know, both for the person with the PCOS and for health professionals dealing with Helping them. Helping them, of course. It's not easy for them. And they do need a lot of support and understanding um to you know to 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 help them find the best solution for themselves you know they probably most women with classic pcos are never going to be you know skinny super skinny. Yes. yes they're not but i think if we can optimize their health and get them into the best possible metabolic Absolutely. health for them Absolutely. the best you know, and, and teach them ways that they can help i think we can i think we can improve things a lot also if we can look at their hormonal balance in much more detail we can actually target um different aspects of their hormonal balance um yes. in, in different ways so the kind of diet that we recommend for um pcos is a diet that's low gi so essentially really important to have low amounts of processed carbohydrates so all the white stuff bread pasta rice potatoes cut it out eat in very small quantities and replace with much more whole grain stuff yeah. Um, so that that's a really important message is low glycemic index. Now, fats are really important, but it's got to be good fats. So we've yeah. got to look at things. Um, so good fats would be things like the, the fats that are found in nuts, seeds, yeah. avocados, olive oil, fish. Um, fish. These fats have got a lot of omega-3 and we know that omega-3 is protective. Anti-inflammatory. Yeah. It's an anti-inflammatory, it, it reduces insulin resistance, and it also reduces testosterone levels. So good fats are really important. Um, we also know that um, eating a wide variety of um, vegetables with lots of phytonutrients and antioxidants. So eat the rainbow plate. When you look at your plate, it should be nice and colourful. Yeah. It shouldn't be uniform. And the rainbow plate, I think, is a really good, good, good term. Eat the rainbow plate. Um, most of your plate should be covered with vegetables. Um, protein, proteins are really important. And I think that it's really important for people to have good quality protein. Yes. And, you know, maybe, I mean, I think, you know, there's a lot of people who, you know, veganism is very popular nowadays. Yes. Um, and I think, you know, and we were talking that a lot of your clients are um, Asian. So in, you know, in, in Asian vegetarian culture. Vegetarian, vegans, lots yeah. Of, yeah, lots of people are vegan, lots of people are vegetarian, but actually the, the Asian people come from a line of people who have been vegan and vegetarian for a long, long yes, period of time. Yes, so yes, yeah. their, their bodies may be quite adapted to it and their genetics may be quite adapted to it. The, the kind of fashion for it now and we 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 have so many over processed vegan foods available in the market they're really toxic mm. you know all those processed vegan foods they're not good for you if you're going to go vegan then you've got to actually pay a lot of attention to your nutrition and you've still got to go for the whole unprocessed foods it's so hard yeah it's very it's actually very hard yeah. to get a balanced diet and to yeah. get the amount of protein you need. that you need you know, like you have to eat a whole packet of falafels to get the same amount of protein as a yeah. piece of chicken or whatever. I think this is one of the arguments I've, I've had in the past with uh, people that are vegan. 
is I say to them, look, it's not just about uh, you eating lentils, you know, we need our essential amino acids, which we can't get in, in mm. small amounts. Yeah. From we have to eat a lot of, of different vegetables and different grains to be able to get those. Yeah. 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 Therefore, yeah. that's going to increase your, uh, your calorie intake. So yeah. if, you, if you're trying to lose weight, that's going to be a bit of a counterproductive thing to do. So yeah. I'm, I'm not saying you shouldn't be vegan, but I'm just giving you the... the I think I think people need to be aware, um, yes. you know, of of some of the nutritional deficiencies they can have, yeah. you know, um, and it's and you know and and being a proper vegan where you're eating a lot of whole unprocessed foods and doing Quality it well, foods. it's very time consuming. Very, very much. Um, you know, and and it, you know, and so you have to be very committed. And I think you probably you know do need some you know you might need to get some uh, some advice from a from a nutritionist yeah. um, to, to be getting it right. Yes. Um, the other thing is avoid an, an, an inflammatory fat. So, you know, again, um, you know, a lot of Asians who are vegetarian, they eat a lot of fried foods. So yes. a lot of their calories come from eating deep fried foods. And a lot of this is in vegetable oil. Now we know vegetable oils have very high levels of omega-6. And when foods are fried, this kind of fat is very, very inflammatory for the body. So anyone who's got PCOS should really try hard not to eat deep fried foods because mm. this can be really ag aggravate them. Yeah. The other thing is in the functional medicine world, we talk about an anti-inflammatory diet and we know that gluten causes leptin resistance. So leptin can't bind to its receptors in the brain because of gluten. And, you know, this has evolved because we're eating so much more gluten now. So again, you know, we've moved from you know, low fat, low protein to high carbs. Carbide. And a lot of the carbs are bread and wheat products, which have a lot of gluten. And our bodies just aren't adapted to have that, that, that level of gluten. And especially, you know, in the States, there's a lot of genetically modified gluten. So this causes autoimmune problems for our bodies. And we actually mount, um, you know, antibody responses to this gluten. And this can have all sorts of problems. So we know that if you're obese, you're likely to have leptin resistance and gluten yeah. makes it worse. So the, the message is avoid overeating too much gluten. Um, you know, and especially if you've got PCOS, you know, you've already got issues with not producing enough um, leptin, you know, yeah. so, so that's something to avoid. The other thing is dairy. We know that dairy and especially um, branch chain amino acids are very common in dairy products. Yes. Now, a lot of dairy products are, um, you know, you get low fat dairy products and that the low fat is replaced with sugar. So actually some low fat dairy products really aggravate inflammation. Um, you know, and so that's another thing that people need to be aware of. It's better to have a, a little bit of a high fat dairy product with less sugar than have a low fat sugary dairy product. Yeah. Um, so that's something to be aware of. And, you know, I, I don't know in your, you know, with personal training, whether, you know, you, you sometimes get people to have whey protein powders. Yeah, a whey protein or even or even a yeah. vegan protein pasta yeah. just your rice yeah. protein. So whey protein is, is actually it's great for people who don't have an obesity problem. And we know that after you've been exercising, actually um, using one of these protein powders can help your muscles build up, you know, build muscles. Yeah. It's actually really positive. But if you've got PCOS, you're probably better off having, you know, a more vegan based protein powder yes. rather than a dairy one. Um so these are the, these are the things that, that are really important. Now, intermittent fasting has also become quite trendy these it days. Has, there's a huge, huge, huge scientific basis behind it. And, you know, it's quite exciting because actually it does. I think it's very, very effective. And certainly, you know, my NHS practice, um, they, there's, there's some GPs involved with diabetes care. And they've been really, really promoting intermittent fasting to help people get out of pre-diabetic states. And it's really, it really works. So I think with people with PCOS, because they've got um, insulin resistance and they've got high levels of insulin in their body, it, intermittent fasting, either sort of a 12 hour pattern. So you eat within a 12 hour window and then you don't eat yeah. for 12 hours, but it's much better. If you can do 18, um, 16, 16 eight, 18. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So if you can do eat, eat it within um, um, a six, uh, an eight hour, eight hour window. window. Yeah. So say you eat from 11 o'clock in the morning to seven o'clock at night, but then from seven o'clock at night, no food should pass your mouth until 11 o'clock the next yeah. morning yeah you can drink fluids and stuff but you know so many people don't realize you know they have real grazing behavior you know they'll have their dinner then they'll sit uh, you know with a set watching tv, yeah. Yeah, yeah. TV um, you know having a snack and you yeah. know we've got this kind of concept that 
you know, it, you, we should never feel hungry. We should be just snacking mm. all the time and keep yeah. our blood sugar stable. Yeah, but yeah, actually, yeah. not true. Um, and actually, you know, going into, you know, a semi-starvation mode for part of the day is really, really healthy for your body. And it, it makes your insulin uh, homeostasis much, much more um, sensitive. I, um, I myself, I've, I've been doing that for years and years and years. I, I probably have my last meal at half five and I don't eat, I don't eat again until about nine o'clock in the morning. Yeah. So that's around 14, 16 hours. And yeah, perfect, perfect. I mean, if you think about it, you know, religious traditions have always had some form of fasting. Most yeah. religious traditions, I mean, you know, Buddhist monks, for instance, I think they don't eat beyond four or five o'clock in the evening. Yeah. Um, you know, and then in Muslims have got Ramadan and, you know, Hindu people have yeah. fast. So I think, you know, that you know fasting's always been recognized around as, yeah there's maybe even quite important but you know now we've got real scientific proof it does decrease your insulin levels it does improve your um uh your lipid profile oh, oh, what it, it does, does as well is it reduces your calorie intake yeah 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 i think it does it's harder to you know so i think overall it's it's excellent yeah. um the other thing that I, I wanted to just briefly touch on that's very trendy these days is gut health. So, you know, lots of people are talking about gut health. And yes. you know, certainly when I was at medical school all those decades ago, we, we didn't know anything about the microbiome. Yeah. We weren't taught about the microbiome. But now, you know, in the functional medicine world is, you know, really buzzing with the gut microbiome. And we recognize that 80 percent of our immune system is lies our within our gut. So ancient, um, you know, uh, so Ayurvedic principles, you know, they, it talks about the gut as being the central axis of your health and we now know that um you know those the balance of those bacteria in your gut are totally totally essential to your to health and actually most people have a lot of what we call dysbiosis so the bacteria is not balanced um you know things like antibiotics and a lot of the things that we have in our modern diets yeah, yeah. Are, are really toxic and with polycystic ovaries with pcos we know that women are much more prone to dysbiosis because high testosterone levels, high cortisol and insulin resistance all cause the bacteria in your gut to not be um, balanced very well. Now these gut bacteria are responsible for um, metabolism, metabolism, they're responsible for um, balance of the neurotransmitters which you know affect our moods, they're also very important for hormonal balance. So the way our estrogen is cleared from our body very much depends on the health of our microbiome. So some very key principles um, to, to, to have a healthy gut is think about prebiotic foods. So prebiotic foods are things like onions, garlic, um, asparagus, leeks. Um, these things are really, really good for, 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 the, for the gut bacteria like to chomp on all of that and mm. that, that keeps them happy. Um, probiotics are things like um, kefir it's food, food that's got um, lactobacillus in them so live yogurt that sort of thing can yeah. be quite good to to get um, good bacteria into your gut and also fermented foods so this is quite trendy now people drink yes. kombucha they eat yes. kimchi um, so you know most most um, cultures have some kind of pickle you know it, pickles yeah. are really popular in Indian food yeah. um, so pickles um, are very you know they, 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 they have lots of beneficial bacteria so it's it's a good idea trying to have some kind of fermented food um, yeah. on a daily basis um, and then you know environmental factors in general you know it, it's shocking the level of toxins we have in our environment so um, you know try and use eco-friendly products on your skin in your in your home you know because these chemicals do build up we have no yeah. idea how much these chemicals are building up in our Absolutely. system and you know we, they, we can't really run away from it yes. uh, because this is our modern life. But we can try you know, and minimise think, it. Yeah, trying to be aware of it, I think, is really, really important. And this is where also eating the rainbow plates really important because we've got toxins flying around everywhere. But the phytonutrients that you eat in all of those vegetables are really good at helping your liver clear those toxins. You know, we've, yeah. we've, we can clear about 200,000 different types of toxins from our body. So the body is very, very good at healing itself and looking after itself, provided you provide it with the right uh, situation and circumstances. Yeah. Um, and so the other thing is exercise. Exercise, we now recognize, is just so important, not just for weight loss and keeping your health stable, but also for mood, movement, movement, daily movement, daily oh, enjoyable God. movement is actually really, really important. And we know that strength training can be really important in women with PCOS as yeah. well. That can also help their hormonal yeah. balance. Um, and finally, sleep. 
We need to sleep a good eight hours a day. We know that our brains clear away lots of toxins yeah. uh, while we're sleeping Obviously. at night. Um, you know, and a lot of people aren't getting enough sleep. So I think, you know, uh, there's a very good book by Dr. Matthew Walker, yep. very popular, Absolutely. about, you know, the importance of sleep. And I think it's a really good read. And, you know, Great it's, it's, yeah, it's really important for us to recognise how important that is. Yeah. So, so this is our, our little potted summary of, yeah. of PCOS. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do at the Marion Gluck Clinic. Um, uh, so this is this is uh, we're, we're the we're a pioneering clinic in bioidentical hormone balancing and integrative women's health. Yeah. Um, and uh, bioidentical hormones are hormones that are exactly the same structure as the hormones of your body. So a lot of women uh, associate bioidentical hormones with um, the menopause and uh, perimenopause. And yes, of course, we see lots of women um, who, who, are, who are presenting with those symptoms. But we can also use bioidentical hormones in helping women with PCOS. Cool. So, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about adrenal health. So our adrenal glands sit on the top of our kidneys. They're tiny little glands and they're really, really, really important. So our adrenal glands produce our stress hormones. So cortisol is our stress hormone and cortisol is really, really important in our body. So it's like, um, you, we need small amounts of cortisol for our immune responses um for our flight and fight response so you know if you walk in front of the road and a bus goes by and you think you're gonna be knocked over you need that little burst yes, of, of, um, of, of of adrenaline to make you run yeah. um but the problem with our modern lifestyles is that we are pumping out cortisol so you know it's not that it's not the tiger that we're threatened by you know like in our hunter gatherer days it's just life in general there's yep. just so much overstimulation there's so much stress the digital age has brought about its own stresses where people are constantly on high alert and this is having quite an impact on our physiology and a lot of people have very very high cortisol levels the other thing, so, so your adrenal glands produce cortisol, but our adrenal glands also produce androgens, which are the male sex hormones. And we know that in PCOS, women have an abnormal pattern of androgen secretion, even yeah. from their adrenals. So we've talked about, we get too much testosterone from our ovaries, but we also have the too much androgens from the adrenals. And so there are different patterns of hormonal, there are different hormonal patterns in PCOS. Yeah. So in, our, in the integrative world, we're able to tease this out a lot more than in conventional medicine. So we can target our treatments and give women the right sort of advice, yeah. depending on the pattern of their hormones. So we know that um, you can get an adrenal dominant pattern of PCOS and you can get a, an ovarian dominant pattern yes. of PCOS. And there, there's a difference in how much inflammation and cardiovascular risk you have. So we know that with um, the adrenal type, the cardiovascular risk is not so high. It's much higher when you're getting, um, you know, a lot of um, testosterone coming out of the ovaries. So there's there are some fantastic tests we can do. Um, so there's this uh, there's a test called the Dutch test, which stands for Dry Urine Total Comprehensive hormone analysis and it's essentially looking at the metabolites of all the different hormones um, in your body um, if, in the urine so you know we, we look we test urine samples but we we have to send the test off to the states so although the labs are in England that we get the packs from the, the actual test has to go off to the states so it takes a few weeks but we get this amazing printout yeah. of production of female hormones how everyone metabolizes their different hormones what's the different patterns of adrenal androgens a testosterone from the ovaries what's converting into what it's just phenomenal i love the dutch test yeah. um and so that gives us a lot of useful information, information. it yeah. also gives us the the pattern of cortisol in the urine um so that's that that's fantastic the other thing that we uh, look at is cortisol patterns. So very often, you know, this is where the individualized picture is so important. So yes. you might have a woman who's had, who's got PCOS, but who had a lot of trauma, who's got a lot of stress going on. Mm. It's not just the PCOS causing stress. There may be other oh, very yeah. stressful life events that have yeah. gone on. And this dysregulates the, what we call the hypothalamic pituitary axis. So this is the axis from your brain um, that goes to your ovaries, that goes to your adrenal glands. And this is the sort of hormonal highway where everything is controlled and the levels of hormones are controlled. Mm. So very often 
women who can't, you know, women who've had a lot of stress can have very sensitive hypothalamic pituitary axis. And what then happens is that they have high levels of cortisol. Cortisol is like the king hormone. Cortisol controls the balance of all the other hormones in your body. So if your cortisol is elevated, what happens is that your body puts a lot more energy into producing cortisol at the expense of your sex hormones. Mm -hmm. um, it can also make you more prone to getting thyroid issues. Um, so by measuring your cortisol, we can do this by looking at saliva, uh, looking at the, the cortisol in your saliva, we get a pattern of what your cortisol pattern is during the course of the day. There's a, a, another thing we look at is the cortisol awakening response. So when you wake up in the morning, but if you've got a, you know, a good cortisol response, you should be fired up, ready to go. So yes, within the yes. first hour of waking up, your cortisol levels should go up by at I, least 50%. I, I, um, and for some people who had a lot of trauma, they, they just don't mount um, a response you know, to this. So they, they don't get very high cortisol levels and they, they remain quite flat during the course of the day. Mm -hmm. And this has lots of implications for them. So, in the, in, so looking at a person holistically, there may be um, situations where I think, oh, I need to do a Dutch test on this person. I need to look at their adrenal glands in more detail. I need to look at their cortisol response. And we're able to do this. So this is where you know, I love the cutting edge science that, that, that we're able to access. But, but you know, using it in, in to create a, a holistic treatment plan for the patient. Um, and um, there, there are lots of supplements that um, we can suggest that can modulate the stress response. So if people are having very high cortisol levels, there are lots of supplements that we can suggest that can bring the cortisol levels down. So these are adaptogens that, you know, uh, have been used in ancient traditions for a yes, long time. Yes. There's ashwagandha, rhodiola, Siberian ginseng. We know licorice can be really helpful. Yeah, yeah. Um, so these are all very important things. We, we also know that for women who have a lot of problems with hirsutism, what happens is that they, test, they have a tendency to convert their testosterone into this thing called dihydrotestosterone, DHT. Now, this is where women with PCOS can get the receding hairline, they can get hair loss, because yeah. DHT is terrible for your hair follicles and it causes your hair to fall out. So male pattern baldness, you know, people have an issue with their DHT um, receptors. So for women, um, if we can actually... Um, decrease the amount of DHT they're producing, they can actually have an improvement in their symptoms. Yes, and there are yes. things like saw palmetto, uh, which is another herbal thing that can actually prevent conversion um, of your testosterone into DHT and can be quite helpful to minimize hirsutism and, and the, 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 the issues that really affect women with PTOS. Um, the other thing that um, is really, really helpful in PCOS is natural progesterone treatment. So um, we know that, you know, we've already discussed that in PCOS, because of the high testosterone levels, women are not ovulating. So One of the ovulating is they're not producing enough progesterone. And not pro progesterone is a really important hormone. It's our natural tranquilizer. It makes people feel a lot calmer. This is why women feel really good in pregnancy because they've got very high levels of progesterone. So progesterone is really, really important. And um, what we know that if you give women, so women who are not getting any periods at all, or very few periods who have got um, PCOS, if we give them natural progesterone, for two weeks of their cycle in, in, in like a, um, in a cyclical form within three to 12 months, they can often reestablish some kind of cyclicity in their pattern. So it actually reestablishes the connection between um, the brain and the ovaries. So that's, that's really, really important. Um, we also know that women who have PCOS very often, they have quite a bit of estrogen, but they don't have enough progesterone and the balance between estrogen and progesterone is quite important. So, mm -hmm. um, we, we know that if we give them natural progesterone, we, we, we improve this balance between the Eastern and progesterone. We decrease their Eastern dominant symptoms, which can often be breast tenderness, weight gain, bloating. So a lot of these hormonal symptoms can be a lot better with the natural progesterone. We also know that progesterone inhibits um, 5-alpha reductase, which is the enzyme that converts the testosterone to the DHT. So if we can stop that, we can also help their hirsutism. 
So I think this is really, really important. So this is a very common treatment for women with PCOS at the Marion Group Clinic, where we will give them bioidentical progesterone treatment. We can give it to them as a cream. It's very easy to use, you know, one pump of cream twice a day for the second half of their cycle in a pattern. And this can often really, really help them. And, you know, we have very good results with this. Um, and this is something that is just not available um, in the NHS. Yes, um, yes. And it's very important for people listening to this webinar to not go and think, well, I'm going to buy some natural progesterone on the internet. Yes, it is yes. Natural progesterone is not harmful. Um, but it does need to be given by a qualified medical professional who knows what they're doing with it. So please, please, please don't go out and get some online because you can buy it online. And this is what gives bioidenticals a bad name. But at the, at the clinic I work at, we have a specialist pharmacy where we specifically compound the creams for each individual patient. And when we say it's got this amount of progesterone in it, it has that amount of progesterone in it. So that's very, very important. And it's really important you know, that people realize that there are ways that we can try and help their bodies. And this is actually where, you know, we're looking at the root cause. We're looking at the fact that one of the issues of the hormonal imbalance is not producing enough progesterone. So instead of putting someone on the pill and blocking it all out, making it worse. We are, yeah. We're looking at the root cause. We're thinking, well, if we actually up the progesterone, what happens is that that then sends a positive signal to your brain and your brain then stops producing a much, as much of the luteinizing hormone, which then raises your testosterone levels. Mm. So this is a way we can balance your body in a much more natural way. Um, that's not, that's, that's also teaching you much more awareness about, you know, your, your hormonal balance. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Do you know where uh, um, the supplement inositol? Uh, yes, I was just going to, I'm just going to say that I meant to talk a little bit about supplements that are really, really beneficial yeah. in PCOS. So vitamin D, vitamin D is actually like a hormone and it's it really, really essential for women's health issues. So PCOS women must take vitamin D. Um, now, a lot of women with darker skin types have naturally low vitamin D levels. So it's really important to get your level checked by your GP and make sure you're taking enough. Some women need to take 2000 units, international units a day to get the amount of vitamin D that they need because their bodies are not very good at absorbing it. So vitamin D, really, really important. Complex B vitamins, also very important for lots of different metabolic processes in your body. Omega-3 fatty acids we've talked about. Now, myo-inositol or inositol um, actually is used quite a lot in the functional medicine world. And in a lot of studies, it's been as effective as metformin without, but without all of yes, the side effects. I've heard about so, that. Yeah, so myonositol definitely. Um, there's also um, other things that we use in the functional medicine world, like N-acetylcysteine, glutathione, CoQ10, L-carnitine. These are all things that help detox. Uh, the body. These are all things that can help um, the ovarian environment to promote ovulation. So, you know, when women come with fertility issues um, with PCOS, you know, very often some of these supplements can be quite helpful in getting them cycling again and getting their ovulation healthy without them mm -hmm. diving into having IVF treatments. Cool. The other mm -hmm. thing is the minerals that are really important. So people who've got insulin resistance, they use up their minerals um, at a much faster rate. So zinc, magnesium, and selenium are really, really important. We know that zinc can protect cell membranes against the damage from all of those leaky fatty acids that we've talked about yes. that can be yeah. quite toxic. Um, so yeah, th those minerals are really quite important, um, which you know you can get from your food. But in you know if we're identifying that you've got deficiencies of any of these, we yes. can actually then target those those things. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so if, if, if people wanted to obviously get in touch with you, uh, whether to go to the clinic or directly with you, if they listen to this, if you know what, I think I need to speak to, to you, to, to someone about this uh, or yourself or anybody at the clinic, how do they go about it to, to find um, you guys? So essentially, um, the Marion Gluck Clinic now, we are, we're completely online okay. um, because of COVID. Um, so it's very easy for you to um, access our clinic. So it's the Marion Gluck Clinic. If you, if you um, I think you'll, you'll probably give people links at the end of this. I, I, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so essentially, you can go onto our website. We've got a, we've got a wonderful information on there. Um, we've got lots of blogs. Um, we've got, um, you know, information about what goes on in our clinic there's lots of doctors there's quite a few doctors that work there i work there um one day a week so you can you can ring up and make an appointment um, amazing 
and and yeah we're really happy to help you um and if yeah, people so want to find more find out more about you and they want to follow your work and your journey is there anywhere they can find you um i have got um i i do do quite a lot of writing for the clinic so a lot of i do put a lot of blogs on the marion gluck clinic i do have an instagram account um uh, and, and, a, and a facebook page um, where I do post stuff on as well. So right. yes, I should probably give I'll you those them, links, shouldn't I? Yeah. yeah. If you, if so you one, the links for obviously the, the website for the clinic, for your Facebook, I've got it, but I don't know if it's a different page. Then, um, yeah, you've got, I think you've got Facebook, you've probably got, I don't know whether you, no, I think I did send you a link to my um, I've got, I've got your, hormone page. And if you send me, send me all the links anyway. I'll send you all of the links. Yeah, so people can, um, so I do tend to put quite a lot of things on my Facebook bioidentical hormone and functional medicine page so anything that i think is quite interesting and relevant to functional Look medicine or hormones i i tend to post on that page so people can follow follow me on that Amazing. um yeah but um yeah I, my deepest hope is to empower women to take control of their health and realize you don't need a pill for every ill and you know, with with the right support and help, you know, look at natural holistic solutions um, to, to to help your body and to to help you live your best life. Absolutely, and I think the next one I wanted to talk to you about would be menopause and perimenopause. I think yeah, we'll we'll very, do, we'll do one on perimenopause important. and menopause, and then the other one that we were going to do is andropause. So I really want know. to talk about that one too. Yeah, yeah, we'll yeah. do that one. I'm we'll really excited one. for all of them. <laughs> Because you That's know what, great. we're giving so much good information, uh, yeah. and uh, hopefully people are going to listen to this and start acting on their on their on their life. I hope so. Oh, I yeah. hope so. I think. I mean, you know, as we were talking about at the beginning of our our podcast here, you know, unfortunately, medicine in the NHS is moving much more towards a depersonalized model. You know, even in my own practice, I've been a GP partner in my practice for 22 years now, you know, and I loved that personalized approach. I loved being able to, yeah. you know, really know my patients. And I've known patients for 22 years. I've followed families through and I really love that. And I think it's really sad now that, you know, even before the COVID crisis, yeah. we were getting into a much more depersonalized model, you know, where it's online access. It's, um, you know, even hospitals are giving people appointments. Um, Mm. Uh, you know virtually and it's video consultations and telephone consultations and look it's the nhs is fantastic we we are able to provide a baseline level of healthcare for everybody in this country absolutely. and that's an amazing thing absolutely but it can't provide you with absolutely everything you know and i think you know it's important for people to realize sometimes they might need to investigate things for themselves you know private medicine does not have to be only for people with insurance you know absolutely. sometimes people do need to seek extra support yeah um for their particular problem you know and and you know because health is really important and we do need to invest in our health yes. in, our, in our health i think obviously as you said you know the nhs is massively under pressure and there's not enough staff and they haven't got the time to 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 yeah. be personalized yeah. anymore no, absolutely. I mean, you know, at the Marion Cook Clinic, we our initial consultation is between 45 minutes, it's 45 minutes, you know, yeah. an hour slot. So we've got 45 minutes and you can really get to know somebody in that 45 minutes. Whereas in, NA, you know, NHS general practice, you have 10 to 15 That's, minutes yeah. per patient max. Yeah. So it's very hard to get the level of information of course, of course. Um, that really helps you understand that patient and what is going to help that patient. Absolutely. It's been absolutely a pleasure to speak to you today. And thank to you. Thank you very much, Helder. No, thank you for taking your time and I look forward to the next one. Definitely. Take care now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Take care. Bye, -bye. Bye. Bye.